Okay, could, could you all please take a seat? Hello, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please take a seat. It's 11.32 already, and we must start this session. So, all right. Um, uh, Elaine, perhaps you can close the doors. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ada Wong. I'm the moderator for this session. Uh, I think my job will be very easy because we have two great speakers here and they can talk on their own and they don't really need any facilitation. Um, this session is about innovating education. We're very pleased to have with us um, Dr. Elliot Walshaw from the United States. He's the founder, co-founder of uh, Big Picture Learning. Now, when I uh, read about Big Picture Learning, I think it is very relevant to the situation in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, we have been talking about how we can connect schools more closely to the community, how we can enable students to have more choices uh, so that their learning could be more relevant, could be more authentic, and could be more real life. Um, in the United States, 30, 40 years ago, Elliot has already started thinking about this thinking about how we don't confine learning in just classrooms, and it is definitely not just taught by teachers, although I do appreciate and respect teachers' professionalism, but learning can take place in the community everywhere, in every corner. And so here is the biography of, uh, a very quick biography of Elliot. Um, I have to ask him later, what does it mean to be the most daring educator? Uh, you know, how, how could we, um, you know, how could we become one? A most daring educator in the world selected by George Lucas Educational Foundation. That's very interesting. And one of the hundreds most inspiring global educators, age educators of 2019. Um, so please um, read uh, Dr. Elliot's uh, uh, Washer's um, biography here. And of course, we have Hong Kong's Professor Chen Kai Ming. Uh, with us as uh, our second speaker. Um, we all know Professor Chen Kai Ming. He's my teacher. Uh, he's my thesis supervisor. And I, and I am who I am today because of the Master of Education program at the University of Hong Kong. Um, Professor Chen will talk to us about science of education, um, which he thinks is actually very, very important for the future of education. So without further ado, could we have a big round of applause to welcome Elliot on stage so that he can talk to us about picture learning, big picture learning, about real life education. Thank you. I'm just getting my uh, technology lesson, so hopefully everything, everything works. Yep, it worked. So, yep, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, yep, I'm Elliot. And when you hear some of what I say, you, it's your decision, your opinion about how daring um, we've been. But as, as the questions go on in the panel, you'll hear a bit more about what we do. But I'm trying to stick to the script kind of that I was given, which I find always impossible. So, uh, but I'll give it a whirl. So this is a, a uh, sign that's a real sign in, in the middle of uh, Australia, taken by a friend of uh, the schools that we have there. His name is Mark Thompson. Um, he's quite a character, and uh, most of his real-world learning takes place in uh, sheds in Ireland, uh, where uh, people have, for generations, uh, made, broken, and fixed things. And he's quite the character, and he's quite a photographer as well. He sent me this, and it says, uh, as you can see, we are here, we are here, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it is now, and uh, the rest is guesswork. Uh, and uh, he sent that to me for a very good reason, uh, because we live in a world that's highly unpredictable, uh, with a lot of ambiguity and a lot of uncertainty, and our students and young people and all of us thrive on that. And yet, in schools, it's all for certain. We know where we're going to go next. Turn the page curriculums. Rote learning, sitting in your seat. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Of course, students are disengaged. That's not who we are as a race. And so this is a big deal. Um, the work also 
that we've done is work through practice. So there's a famous baseball player in the United States, former Yogi Berra. And uh, he has a, a beautiful statement, because he's known for mixing up his words. And in education, I'm kind of known for mixing up my words as well. And he said, uh, in theory, theory and practice are the same. But in practice, they're different. So if you think about that a little bit, uh, you'll get the point. You have to be a practitioner. You have to be on the ground. The work emerges. And there's a famous guy, Charles Lindblom. He's 100 years old. He's at Yale at 96 years old, and he was the guy who wrote about muddling. That was his economic theory. And his last paper was still muddling, not yet through. And he equated doing the work as a work on a potter at a wheel, that you have to feel your way through it. It's not just about the data from the outside. It's that you have to have a sense and a feel for what you're doing. So that's what we do. And as you do it, the work emerges, and the pot gets to a place where you say, it's done now. And then you make another one, and the same thing happens. So that's a really important statement uh, for me. So this is an interesting little piece that I saw in the New Yorker uh, when it used to come as paper to my house. And I called up my buddy Frank Wilson, who's a very famous neurologist who was at Stanford. Uh, he's retired now. And he wrote a book called The Hand. And uh, his uh, story is, uh, you can't talk about uh, human intelligence without talking about language and the hand combined. And yet, we've cut the hand off in schools. The hand informs the mind just as much as the mind informs the hand. And when we looked at that, he called me almost at the same time because he got his New Yorker magazine delivered about the same time. He said, did you see what I see? Do you see what I see? I said, yeah, that's, kind of, that's amazing. So I called up the guy who illustrated it. Because I was like, well, what's going on here? Did you know what you were drawing? He says, yeah, I think I knew what I was drawing. I said, well, tell me. And he was exactly on the money with Frank and I. So obviously, this is a mom with her baby in a relationship doing the same things. So in neurology, so, uh, Frank would say, that's dopamine and oxytocin working together, all right? That's neurotransmitters going, I want a relationship with you, and I want to get better at the things I want to get better at. And that's what we formed our schools around, relationships and the things that you want to get better at. And as you go deep, you learn many things. That's not what Elliot said. Van Gogh said that. And we do the, just the opposite in schools, mile wide, inch deep in most cases. So that's a, port, and a very, very important little illustration that says a lot about who we are. So I'm going to have you watch this for a second. <laughs> granddaughter. Oh, no, it's not my granddaughter. It's not my granddaughter. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's not my granddaughter. But that's really, really powerful. What do we, every young person is like that. And parents who get connected through that bonding and through what they want to get better at. That's powerful. That's occurring in a church. That young child, like all young children, is going to go to school. What do we do with that? Put them in a seat and tell them to sit still? That's crazy. What do we do with it? So that's a long conversation we could all have about just that one 30-second clip right there. Now, 
My buddy just sent me this two days ago, three days ago, right before I left from California. He's a, a craftsman and, a, and a, a carpenter and, and an incredible artist who does work in our house. This is his grandson, and this is his other uh, grandfather. This happens all the time. There's that dopamine and oxytocin working together, or being with somebody, not doing something to somebody. With is a powerful word in big picture. Being with students. They're at the center, and they take the lead, and they go to their edges. And as Jane Jacobs said, you have to take, go to the edge with somebody and declare it your center. And that's how things change. That's the innovative piece. Real, real simple. That kind of intensity is around not just I want to learn how to do that, but I want a relationship with you. And when we get that with our children in and outside of schools, that's where the learning is very, very powerful. So this is another illustration. Somebody who's a friend of mine in New Orleans, we just won an XQ prize in New Orleans, and they gave us $10 million, God knows why, um, to build a, a brand new school that's a big picture school. No, it's a, a really good school, huh? and it's called New Harmony High, and it's about uh, what are the new harmonies? What's the new work? What's the new art? What's the new music? What's the new food? What's the new way to live dealing with climate change in a city that's basically underwater and below sea level? So this is her grandson. She says, Ellie, take a look at this. This is my grandson's art. I said, wow, he's five years old. Look at the intensity of that drawing. Circles within circles within circles within circles. There's a lot of patterning there. That's math. That's mathematics. But I know Bobby. Bobby, grandma, is an architect. Daddy is an architect. When the young child shows that to his dad and his grandma, those are those neurotransmitters in operation. We don't have to call them neurotransmitters. We don't need the science to tell us that, but we like to be informed about it because it helps us think about learning. Like Project Zero said at Harvard, you know what Project Zero is? Know why they call it Project Zero? Because we know zero about learning. We think we know a lot. We don't. There's so much more to know. So much more to know. So here's something that is about the outside. Now, there's Autobahns, there's Da Vinci's, there's Darwin's, there's Alicia Keys, there's Bob Dylan, there's Ramanujan. All of those are their notebooks. And there's two of our students' notebooks there as well, because they didn't know that they were going to become famous, none of those people. Not one. And yet, all those notebooks are glass encased in museums where you can't touch them. When you go into industry, and these are for the uh, entrepreneur innovation folks in the audience, may not be educators, PowerPoints don't go into a law when there's a litigation around intellectual property. Research papers don't go in. You can check it out because I've worked with the industries around us. What goes in? Somebody's notebook. How much credit do we give students' notebooks in school about what they're writing about? What's the power in that? We're starting to do that because we're starting to talk to industry about what is important. It ain't a PowerPoint or a research paper that are the most important. How much time do we spend on that? They're always in their notebooks writing down stuff that matters to them. Mattering is a big word. Muddling is a big word. I'm going to give you the three M's. Mattering is a big word. And mingling is a big word. Mingling with mattering to and muddling through. Those are all important pieces around how to develop cross-sectional relationships in and outside of school. Famous Bruegel painting, The Plowman or The Fall of Icarus. What's interesting here, and this is a long time ago, they, everybody knows this, every culture, it's cross-cultural. Doesn't matter where you are, what timing it is in history. There's Icarus falling into the drink. He wanted to fly, he got too close to the sun. Every adult in that picture has their heads turned away from Icarus, is not paying attention to what he's doing. That was the message of the plowman in the fall of Icarus that Bruegel painted. That influences our schools. Every one of our schools 
Our students have an advisor in the school connected to a mentor outside the school where two days a week our students are outside of school around their interests developing relationships with people that they want to have a relationship or what are, uh, around what they are interested in. There was the warning right there. Did we pay attention is the question. So I was involved in a study by the federal government in the, in the U.S. Department of Education. They called me and another guy up and they said, we want to study disengagement. And this is that, what we were talking about earlier, decision-based evidence making. We think evidence decision, uh, evidence-based evidence -based decisions are the gold standard. Little do we know that we make decisions around the evidence and it's very, very subjective. So they said, Elliot, life events, behavior, academic failure, and disinterest. That's why kids leave school and get disinterested in it. I said, wait a second, there's a heck of a lot more research than that. And at any given time of any given student in their life cycle of when they're in a school, any one or any combination of those things can disengage them. Any day of the week, any month, or for years, if nobody is paying attention to who's in front of them. Mattering. What matters to the student is the school paying attention to the community. Fitting, the student has elected to go to the school. The parents send them to the school. They're trying to fit the school. Does the school fit them? Their interests, their talents, how they feel every day, what's going on in their lives. Unrecognized talents and interests. Benjamin Bloom did a study. What did he find out? He studied people who were famous at what they did Mathematicians, swimmers, ballet dancers, engineers. Here's what he found. A child had a little talent outside of a school. They belonged to an organization. The organization said, your kid is great to the parent, doing pretty well. Child, do you like it? Yep, I like what I'm doing here. I like sailing boats. Parents say, you want to sail boats? Child says, yes. Organization, everybody continues along the way. Next step, organization says, knock, knock. This child is really, really good and too good for this organization. They need a technique mentor. Do you want one? Yeah. Parents, do you want your child to pursue that? Yeah. The rest is history. That's how we get, that's how talent is developed. Lauren Sosniak did a follow-up study. Both of them passed away, unfortunately. And what did she find out? She found out that there's a near zero correlation to developing talent of young people that schools pay attention to. They're all about the content that's in front of them, granting diplomas around the content, seat time and giving out grades. So unrecognized talents. Restrictions. A professor, his name escapes me right now, did a study on how restrictive school environments are to children. What he found out was they're more restrictive than a being a Marine Corps recruit or being a convicted felon in a prison. You can't even get out of your seat to go to the bathroom. You can't talk. You can't move. You can't use your hands. You can't weave or braid or do, you know, you just got to pretend like you're right on the money and some of you may like being here and some of you may not. I can't tell. But you're here and it's a lecture and normally that's not the best way to do things, but if you want to learn from a lecture and you made a decision personally to be here and used your agency to do it, that's pretty cool. Most of the time that's not happening in schools though. So uh, restrictions, when we talk about the government and cross-sectional relationships that we need, schools need to loosen their restrictions, allow students to learn outside of school and manage that learning. They need to have more time for exercise. They need to have time to eat well. When people talk about gold standard evidence base on performance, sugar, fat, salt, in heavy quantities in school affect performance. They affect performance of all of us. They also lead to diabetes, as was talked about in the opening session, heart disease, cancer. Think, think about happiness. You're not happy if you're sick. Even if you have a college degree and multiple degrees, you got to take care of your health. What role is school taking care of, taking a part in that? Let alone the arts, which Ada talks about a lot. We had just a little brief conversation about it. Mathematician, you can't find a mathematician, a great mathematician or scientist who's not a wonderful artist. And they had to make a decision whether they were going to be an artist 
or a musician, a mathematician, a scientist, or an engineer. This is crazy what we do. The rhythms of that young girl are math, those patterns. The drumming of, of a tabla, patterns, mathematics. That's how Manju, who won the Fields Medal at Princeton, his mom took him out of school, sent him back to Punjab, where he learned tabla from his uncle, Sanskrit poetry from his grandfather. The rhythms of the arts produce the math. We don't get it in our schools. So those are really important things. I'll say a few more things. I don't know how much time I got up there. You give me two, three minutes, and I can stop whenever. So this is a famous vaudeville skit. Abbott and Costello, you may or may not know it, I don't, but it's very famous in the United States. And it's called Who's on First? And it's a play with words kind of like what I do all the time. So a woman, Julia Freeland Fisher, a researcher, just wrote a book called Who You Know? And we're in the book, and I've had multiple conversations with her, and I said, Julia, it's a great book. It's beyond just who you know. Schools only grant, uh, grant diplomas and certifications on a what. What and who need to be merged and married? What and who happen out in the real world? That's how we got an edge with our schools, because we knew that who knows you know what you know and who you learn from on the outside one-on-one -on -one in serious situations to develop skill sets and mindsets about the things that you're interested in gives you very, very deep and clear understandings of things that start to get you on the road to not just taking in information and spitting it back, but actually get into understandings and wisdom. That happens on the outside. It doesn't happen just from a book. We have a friend named Reed Hastings who's a mathematician and a philosopher, <clears throat> one of the top, sh top chefs in Chicago. And he says, I can read five books on any subject and know what 95% of the world knows about it. But to know what that other 5% that the world knows about that subject is going to take me the rest of my life. And we don't think about that in schools at all. So who knows you know what you know matters. That's why we get our students out two days a week. And we have pretty incredible results around all the traditional measures and all the measures that we use around our students' lives. Students at the center, people talk about that a lot. But if you have a batch processing system that's all about standards and standardization, students can't declare their center at their edge. You have to be with them and follow them out. So students at the center could be made meaningless if the restrictions of school prohibit them from being who they are and who they want to show you. That's my book out there. I have a few copies for people who just want to pick them up at the end, um, just give them to you. It's about leaving to learn. We leave to learn and then come back. We created a school and a set of schools, and not more than that, some notions about programming that any school can use because that's where the learning is. Schools get all the credit and all the blame, but it doesn't happen out there. Parents, mentors, organizations, churches, that's where students are learning. And we have to credit it where it happens because learning happens 24-7. That's our, um, the guy who did the I Love New York logo. Oh, we went back. My wife is telling me, she's uh, coaching me out there. I can pay attention, thank you. So, um, so this is our, uh, <laughs> Yep, there you go. You got an applause there. That's good. So this is, um, what's the guy's name? Oh. <laughs> so, so this is um, the guy who did the I Love New York logo. He found us, and he made this thing. I think it looks like a bottle cap, but it, it, anyhow, I think his last design thing was a bottle cap. But it kind of says what we're about. Mentors, students in an advisory system, Parents, that green thing is chopped off a little bit, but each student goes into that center. And that's what's important. That's how you center and get students out on their edge when they're outside of school and the discussion happens. That's our, our lowest common denominator of our schools is each and every student. We're one student at a time in a community of learners and we organize schools around that for the same cost, per, cost that schools get in any place around the world so far. So, I just want to say one thing about one of these pieces here. This is some of our guides that we use to help support the work. But when you take a look at the role of a teacher, arguably people will say one of the things that we did is we changed the role of a teacher to the role of an advisor. What's the difference? Very simple. 
Teachers are most of the time instructing and talking to somebody. Advisors are listening and finding out from students. What do you like to do? What you like to do when you were three years old? What are your interests? Who are the people that you hang out with? What do your parents think about what you're doing? I don't know the answers to those questions. I have to listen. That's giving me information and an understanding of who, of who each and every child is. That's why we have a learning plan at each and every one of our schools. So we start out with these expectations that we think students have of schools, and we could talk about that more. We took those expectations, and we developed programming from that. These are stu things that students want of us. Time to do things, practice, authenticity. Those are some of them. And the timing. All of those programs at the top are the new structures of our big picture schools, and arguably other schools are doing it. We, we, don't, we don't do big picture schools to do big picture schools. We do big picture schools to influence the system. This is some of our results. Same data as what schools use, also different data. Healthy relationships we measure. Adult self-fulfillment. Meaningful work, we did a longitudinal study of our students 15 years out in all of our schools. That's what we're interested in. One of the things that we found out is that about 72% of our students had work after they graduated college two and four years in the internships that they had while they were in high school. That means something to every city, especially a city like Hong Kong probably, who loses a lot of students to brain drain. They leave because they don't think there's anything there for them when actually there is. So this is us. These are some of our students. I'll talk about Jennifer for a second. Uh, Jennifer, that's, she's 16 years old. She's in the prenatal care unit, high-risk pregnancies at Rhode Island Hospital. This is what happens. Most of the nursing students think she's a nurse there. She's not. She's a student, a high school student. She watched two women come in, high-risk pregnancies. One had insurance, one didn't. They received different care. She said, that's not fair. Okay, her advisor and, and her, with her, said, do a project. Project was around insurance rates, who gets different care because they have insurance, uninsured versus insured. She presented to the hospital board, they changed their policies. Really powerful stuff. That's what our students do. This is another one of our students. He was a bike technician when he started out. Now he just reached, that's the governor of Rhode Island right there in the blue, light blue. That's the mayor right next to the governor of Providence. He won a $400,000 grant to change the park system in Providence around bike trails. And he was the one who designed it. This is another one of our students who works in the water systems and developed a tool that cost $10,000 and he made it for $700. This is another one of our students who had verbal apraxia, or has verbal apraxia, when she came into her school, that means kind of like you can't talk. When she came into her school, she couldn't shut up. All right, it was a small environment. She felt comfortable. All of a sudden, she starts talking. Um, she was interested in drone technology. She's got a full scholarship, a uh, Gates Scholar, from, to uh, Laterno College in uh, Texas. These are, this is our school in New Orleans. This is a project that just came into the school. This is only ninth graders. The school just started out. This young artist said, I'm going to build a canoe and people put people's stories on it. They're going to write their stories about Katrina. And it's all going to be a paper canoe and it's going to work. Her, his dad came in, who's a surgeon, and there he is in his scrubs coming in to help out. And this is the beginning of how we start our schools to bring the inside, the outside in and the inside out. There's our students. They're working side by side with the artist. When that's done, their narratives are going to be on that canoe. Anybody who writes their narrative onto that canoe or draws an image gets to use that canoe. That's going to be a canoe that's not glass encased. It's going to be on the outside. So this is Jada. Jada works at the Botanical Gardens. She works in almost all of our schools now across the country around making plant-based diets in our schools, healthy foods for our students. And that's her mentor, Robin, who's one of the heads of the Botanical Gardens in Providence. This is Johnny. Uh, Johnny I know real well. Johnny started out, once again, as a bike technician. But when you probe and you know the student, it's not about the bikes. It's about helping people. I wanted to help people who wanted to get their bikes fixed. 
when he got over the bike stuff, and he did, because it's around developing interests, not one interest, and uh, staying with him on his journey, he became an EMT in the community. That's what he wanted to do, and he'll probably become a registered nurse. This is Ian, he's a fisherman. He probably makes more money than any one of our graduates ever. When he was in our school, um, the Coast Guard employed and quotes him at his internship because he knew more about the shoreline than they did. And he helped map the shoreline of Narragansett Bay. This is Natalie, she's with the mayor in Providence, kind of like his chief of staff, high school students. Boy, do we underestimate students and their abilities and the things that they can do. Uh, this is a young student at one of our new schools, a ninth grader, uh, developing a prosthetic device. So um, I'll stop there, and uh, thanks very much. I'm looking forward to the conversation we're going to have, and uh, more to come. Thank you very much. Oh, I just want to mention, and all of those things involve collaborations with people outside of the school that students generate. We didn't generate them. They emerged through the students' interests. Okay, just. Thank you so much, Elliot. Um, he has left a lot of questions on my mind, and I'm sure on yours. So, uh, but before we ask uh, Professor Chen Kaiming uh, to do his talk, uh, in my excitement, I forgot to explain that uh, this session is actually a co-creation and collaboration between the Social Enterprise Summit and Ednovators, uh, which is a non-profit in Hong Kong uh, to advocate, to suggest and, uh, to people new ways of thinking about education. Um, this year's uh, Social, Innovation, uh, Social Enterprise Summit, uh, the theme is Innovating for a Happier Society. We think that to start a happier society, we need to innovate for a happier education. We need students to be engaged, we need students to build relationships, we need students to learn both inside schools and outside schools, as what Elliot has suggested. Um, and I'm quite sure that Professor Cheng agrees. So without further ado, could we invite Professor Cheng for his talk? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ada, for the invitation. Uh, she mentioned I was her teacher. You know what her dissertation is about? It's a qualitative study about uh, what are the characteristics of uh, innovative teachers. Right? <laughs> that is an uh, innovation that started 10 years ago, yes, uh, when she was in kindergarten. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah when I heard what uh, Elliot is going to, uh, to say, I said, oh, this is right what we want in Hong Kong. Uh, we, uh, we have a small group of people who some of us actually started the last round of reform in 1999. And uh, then we found in 2014 that maybe we should do something to tell the society what happened, uh, to tell society what happened. And then we found that perhaps it's not so, uh, it's not adequate to look backward, but have to look forward. And the net result of that is we come up with what we call Education 2.1, and uh, I'll, I'll not go on with that. But one of our proposals which came true is to set up a big education platform, uh, and the organizers actually here. Uh, we use big, right? We all think big. <laughs> the earlier, that is a, a common ground. And, uh, but before, that was the notion of uh, three of our, one of our three uh, kind of a mottos. One is education for all, to everybody, just uh, equity. Uh, second is all round education, and that is somehow related, that is education is not only about, uh, it's about experiences, which I'll explain later. But the third one is all for education. That is, education should not be constricted, uh, restricted to schools and the teachers. It's the whole society, and that uh, apparently echoes uh, what Elliot said very much. And that was based on our study before we launched that at all. In 2014, uh, we, we, uh, 2015, we did a study on, uh, on a sample of 228 schools, which is about one-fifth of the total population, and to, I did, to see how many projects they have with uh, 
organizations outside education. And uh, the result was very encouraging. We found that of all the primary and secondary schools, for each school, there's an average of 9.8 projects, almost 10 projects that are partnership with somebody outside the school. And they're not doing curriculum matters. It's not inviting them to teach uh, English in schools or for, for our students to do uh, curriculum related uh, matters. It's fundamentally doing things that are not in schools as an early experience, early engagement in experiences in society. And I, I suppose that was four years, five years ago, uh, four years ago, it must be, the number must have uh, uh, increased. The organizations involved in those days, uh, at, at that small sample, is 2003. And I think this is much more now. So the first thing is, we really have to, to see what has happened already. It's not due to government policy. There's no government funding. And there is no uh, particular uh, advocates at that time, but it happens. So it was really a trend that is appreciated by society, not only by educators, but by people outside education, outside schools, who think this is essential for our children. And they all feel very happy with little monetary reward, with no expected uh, kind of a, uh, uh, physical incentive. So that is only my preface. What I'm going to say is likely to take uh, three hours. But, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll squeeze everything into about 20, 15 minutes. Uh, my beliefs are two, and this has driven me in the past 20 years. The ultimate aim of education is to prepare young people for the future. I presume you uh, agree. The second is the core business of education is learning. Now, I use the word business, and maybe a little bit too business, but I think it's the core activity, the core uh, attention should be learning. And I try to work in two, these two directions. Before I, we started the education reform, my mind is always on education, about schools, curriculum, teachers, parents, and so on and so forth. But then because of the education reform, I began to know, to think that if we are going to prepare our young people for the future, what is future? How is future different from what we have now? And then I discovered that first, things that will happen in 16 years' time when our primary one kids graduate from university, it will be a totally different society. Because at that time, in 1990, 2000, what we had at that point was what we never had expected 16 years before. Society is changing very, very quickly, a very, very large extent, and uh, uh, to the extent that we could not recognize it. And to put it simple, I think, how do we know what will happen in the future? It's rather impossible, but I can only say future is now. It's already happening. That is macro. And then because of that, I found that our system is fundamentally about channeling students into a narrow path with a target of a job. Governments invest in education because of GDP growth, because of uh, international competitive, uh, global competitiveness. Uh, and why do you have uh, students learn educate, uh, uh, do education? A lot of government policy will say, still say is employability. Or in China, it's about Ren Chai, about talents. It's an economic discourse. But now, I'm going to explain that this is no longer possible. It's no longer possible. Channeling them into a narrow target is actually depriving them of real opportunities. And therefore, I turn to learning rather than credentials. Now, I've already taken too much of our time, so I'll try to <laughs> fast forward. Uh, this is John, my friend, who graduated in electrical engineering in my own university. 
Uh, he was appointed to the Department of uh, Electrical Engineering in Kavan, uh, promoted to a very senior position. You see his signature everywhere. And then he chose to retire 55. Now he's enjoying his retirement, doing arhu and uh, doing painting and so on and so forth. This is typical of 20th century. However, and this is a kind of a one credential, one job, one occupation, one organization. Right? Uh, however, this is 1971. Right? And this is a typical career path in the industrial era. Right? In Chinese, it's even more dramatic. You don't have much Chinese, but uh, it's a yi ji bang shen, yi zi wen ping. Every kind of idiomatic expression with one. But this is no longer true. And uh, I try to understand. Society has changed, in particular, career paths. I start with career paths, although society is not only about career paths. I'll give you a few slides on statistics. This is what the mismatch in my own university which is perhaps even less than typical. Medicine is the only, only where you have a little dispatch because perhaps the uh, income <laughs> incentive is so great. Law, 15 to 20%. In US, law school is a graduate school, is by choice, it's even bigger. Sometimes it's more than 50% mismatch. They don't take up law as their profession. Engineering, to my surprise, 35%. And otherwise, it's all the same. Biology, biology, psychology, history, they all do more or less the same thing. The second, this is Imperial College UK. I got this about eight years ago. Year one, the, the question is, do you want to be an engineer? Year one, 81% said yes. The dean was very furious. The other 19%, why are you here? Right? He said, I've spent all my effort to tell them how interesting, how exciting is engineering. But year four, huh, only 44%. So he was totally upset. Uh, the changes, now this is Australia, a, an institute in Melbourne, 2016, two years ago. They reckoned that for an individual, average individual, he or she will take up 15 jobs in his or her uh, lifetime. That reminds me, 10 years before that, 2006 in UK, there's a, another statistics that estimated that average individual would take up 13 jobs. I couldn't believe it at the time. I turned to the Department of Labor, US, 10.6 jobs. Right? And before that, 2002, 4.3 occupations. These are hard statistics. Unfortunately, we don't have that in Hong Kong. Uh, but it's quite common. Right? Once there was a crew doing an interview with me, and then I said something like this, all of them said, this is my sixth job. This is my fifth job. They are all under 30. Right? It's, it's a common phenomenon. So the mismatch is only about the first job. Even the first job is a match, you don't know where they go. So now it's about study this match about frequent changes, uh, occupations, but many of them don't want to have a job. Right? Right? Don't want to have a job. Don't want to be appointed. They want to be on their own, startups, and uh, freelancers serving many, many clients at one time, uh, multiple portfolios doing many, many different types of jobs at one time, uh, intermittent work, gain salaries for two years, go to travel. Patagonia, right? another two years, Baltics. Right? This is what they do. And when I said this, the older people began to worry. Are you sure you want to quit such a good job? What are you thinking about your retirement? But all the young people say, I admire this. I want to be like that. Right? It's a different way of thinking. Unemployment, uh, intermittent unemployment, or intentional unemployment, that is, they don't want to work at all. 
I can tell you a small story. <laughs> One time in the gathering in Paris, and uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, leading researcher in the World Bank said, when you said these people who lie, lay in, uh, who stay in the, in the families and stay at home and don't want to work, I have one, my son, is like this. And immediately, another senior person, OECD said, embarrassingly, my son is also like this. Right? But they all refer to sons, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there are fewer jobs around. There's a small little change in the US. The, the growth of jobs is slower than the growth of population. So full, popul full employment is beginning to be uh, uh, suspicious. And there are new occupations. They don't know what they are, right? And so on. Now, this is, I want to understand why. One explanation is because these young people are corrupt, right? They don't have work ethics, right? But the other explanation, perhaps, is that we don't know the reality. We, we educators are a little bit backward. We live in the 20th century. They are in the 21st century. Uh, so I try to explain, no, I, this I'm consolidating what would be an hour into two minutes. The production for needs no longer. This production to create desire. Right? Uh, I won't ask the same question because many of you have heard. I ask, normally ask the audience how many pairs of shoes you have at home, and they all smile to themselves. Right? Do you need so many pairs of shoes? Are the shoes all the same? No. No. So we have gone past the, the era where you produce for needs. You may say no. It's not oversupply. You have still have hungry people in, uh, in Africa, but producers don't look at that mar as a market. The market is on where you have money, where governments print their notes, and so on and so forth. And mass production, therefore, is a bygone issue. This is where industry, industrial society started. Right? Everybody does a small bit of the action, you combine into a sophisticated project, uh, product, and then mass produce. And therefore, you need mass of workers with work lines, and production lines, and then you have supervisors, and the supervisor of supervisors, and so on. It's a pyramid. But now, it is basically about less of more, less quantity, more variety. It's about individualized production, about customized service, it's about tailor-made uh, services, and so on and so forth. Right? And so the, the notion of a big company uh, big organization for division of labor, for departments and layers, is no longer the trend. Uh, I can give you a very simple example. I just mentioned this to some of our participants here who are from Shanghai. Maxim. You know Maxim's in Hong Kong? Right? It used to be a Cantonese restaurant, which is very famous because of its menu, decoration, uh, service styles. How many Shops are there, restaurants are there in Maxim in Hong Kong. Over 600. Right? My mother lives in Taikushing. There are four restaurants surrounding the, uh, surrounding the uh, open area. Cantonese, Pekingese, Shanghainese, and uh, Sichuan. They are all Maxims. But they are not all, they're called, not one of them, not, none of them are called Maxims. So you walk into a restaurant in, in uh, Central, 60% uh, of the time you're in the maxims, right? Less of more. Right? Across the road from the Hong Kong University, there's a PhD shop selling PhD. No, it's Pizza Hut Delivery. Right? <laughs> you try to change the names to, to uh, okay. And therefore, large companies have gone to small, flat, loose, and fragile one-stop shops, one-stop units. Even in large organizations like investment banks, they work in small units. Task force, deal teams, program teams, project teams, one team for one client. It's not like in the old organization, each, organiza each client has to go through all the departments and each department will serve all the clients. Right? It's a totally different setup. Now, because of that, think of an organization. They're very small. They're fragile. You ask an employer, what kind of manpower do you want? 
The best he can tell you is what he wants now. What do you want two years from now? That was how we did manpower forecasting in the 1970s. Most likely they will tell you, I really don't know. Five years time, I even don't know whether my, my, my company will still exist. I may change to something new. Right? If this is the case, organizational commitment, employers to employees is very much weakened. Very much weakened. Commitment, security, protection, it's not easy because even the organization itself is fragile. And how do you expect the employees to be loyal to the organizations? How do, they expect, how do you expect them to, to, to secure uh, protection from the organization? How can they ex you expect the young people to have long-term uh, expectation of long-term employment? So if that is the case, then it's easy to understand why young people are getting into totally different career paths. Now, I'm a little bit long, so I'll shorten the next part. But it's a change that is fundamental, comprehensive, and irreversible. Right? It's a fundamental change, not because of a trend, not because of a, a kind of a, a fashion. It's something that's fundamentally changed, because we look for quality of life, we look for variety, and everything happens. Volatile, cert uncertain, this is quite common in the literature, the Volca Society. Uh, so I, they have different views about jobs, careers, success, satisfaction, and happiness. It is a case, but most countries are still thinking of manpower, about jobs. Uh, but in the workplace, you will see these are happening which requires much more than knowledge and skills. And that is perhaps what Elliot was also pointing to. But we pay much less attention. In Hong Kong schools also, we also have the so-called moral education or the affective domains of learning, which is quite uh, common in the Chinese communities. However, uh, eventually you have to pass examinations, you have to get scores, and people take scores for almost everything, uh, which is indispensable. Most of these are not learned through the formal curriculum and is education preparing our young people for a workplace uh, future. And there comes experience, experience. And I'll explain quickly my understanding. Oh, I'll forego for this, this is uh, MIT, the skills that they use uh, more are less learned from universities. I, I will skip that. This is something due to one of our uh, Haley Khan. She did a study on five cases from Morgan Stanley, MTR, Underground Station, uh, Giordano, and to a single <coughs> freelancer. She found that the salary differential for the same university, same degree, and same occupation, so same paper, same branding, and same occupation, the salary could be very different. That means employers are looking for something well beyond the diploma, well beyond the credentials. So what are they? What are they? Yeah, th these are things that are coming. Future is not only about work, it's not only about manpower, only resources. My mom is 99. I hardly think she's part of the human resources, but she has to learn. She has to learn a lot. Learning is a human instinct, I think you agree, but education is not. Education is a system of learning designed by human beings for human beings. And therefore, Education is an institution influenced by economic, political, social, or cultural, spiritual underpinning of the time. That means the design could be obsolete. I think we are facing that. We are facing that.
The real change are facing people have to learn how to learn, and hence learning to learn, uh, and therefore the science of learning. I'll go through very quickly uh, in a nutshell. My understanding of science of learning, which is emerging, there are, I've reckoned that there are over 2,000 researchers in the United States, which is by far the largest group, uh, very much led by NSF, National Science Foundation, who work on science of learning. In Europe, a few hundreds. Uh, in Asia, a few dozens. And we have to, the fundamental thing is very, is human brains are plastic, but human activities shape human brains. Human brains are not shaped by milk powder as advertised in TV, <laughs> right? Milk powder will make you strong, like a physically strong, but doesn't mean you become an athlete. Right? Knowledge and skills is due to experience, not due to milk powder. Uh, I consolidate into five principles. One, learning is meaning making. It's making meaning of what you see. Meaning, a newborn child no new, uh, can see everything, can hear everything, but no meaning. It's through activities, the child began to understand this is human voice, this is mother's face, and so on and so forth. Therefore, it's knowledge construction due to the individual minds. Therefore, it's not poured into the brain, individual brains. The second, so we need them to be active learners, and uh, we have to give them, of course, we have to motivate them, but also we have to give them choice which is already not very usual in this part of the world, but we have to give them space for them to develop their own learning, which is almost non-existent. Uh, oh, I'll go through quickly. The principle two is learning is a matter of experience, and there comes all these activities. Uh, practice and understanding are intertwined. We used to think that schools for understanding for theories. Don't do anything yet. And then afterwards, you go to society and practice. In, even in science, I was a graduate of, of uh, mathematics and uh, physics. You do the theory first, and then you go to the laboratory. Right? This is a logical sequence, but it's against the learning process. People don't learn like this. Uh, and we talk about power of context. Things are learned much more effectively when it is in contact, when it is in application, when you're really using it. What is happening now is we have society which is very diverse. We have individuals who are also very diverse, but in between them is only a very narrow bridge, education. And education is already uh, a too respectful word. It means a few subjects, examining scores. And they have to cross this in order to get into society. Now we have to expand the learning experience in schools, and then we have to add other learning experiences. And therefore, learning by doing, broadening experiences, experiential learning, uh, early experience real society. And the last one is exactly what we meant by involving society. There are ample resources in society that are not used for learning. Right? We pretend that you are about future, about jobs. We schools are doing learning. Learning is holistic, implicit learning. They learn when they do it. Right? It's not because you tell them, because they've done it. And uh, not for, it's, it's social condition, it's by group. Right? And the last one is about testing. Because in this part of the world, examination is the common enemy to Japan, Korea, Chinese communities, and even Vietnam. All these, I call them the chopstick cultures. Right? The common enemy is examination because of this ancient civil examination that started in the year 603. The test of learning is understanding, and the test of understanding is in application. And therefore, uh, assessment should, be, should not be uh, it should be what one can do rather than what one knows. But over, over, over the globe, 
The largest percentage of testing is about what they know. But you go to the employer, they will say, I don't mind what you've learned. I really want to know what you can do. Right? This is the reality. And uh, therefore, estimates should, be, should contain elements of uh, creation, application, integration, collaboration. Right? Uh, this is not what we do for traditional subjects. And therefore, in the universities, the, the learning commons are replacing the uh, uh, libraries. They, uh, you see groups and students sitting together to do projects, uh, collaboration, and try to create something, integrate it, something OK. Uh, learning is not about knowledge and skill. This is what we advocated. It should be about capability, which is knowledge and skills, and which is very much done by curriculum. Also, attributes about dealing with people, dealing with work, and so on and so forth, is you have to come from experience. But even if you have very good capability and attribute, you could be a bad guy. You could be a bad guy. So you have to have values. But where do values come from? Enculturation. Family influence, peer influence, teacher's role model, school styles, how you handle. And, uh, but unfortunately, this is very idealistic. Nowadays, very much value systems, knowledge, are shaped by the media. And we know very little about how people learn from media. And we have, this is left for our, yes. Uh, therefore, big education, as I mentioned, and I uh, will not repeat. This is our kind of motto. Uh, there's no limit to education innovation. No limit. Right? Like uh, in the market, they say customers don't know what they want. Right? Uh, but then, there's always a reason and an idea. For a reason. Right? For a reason. Uh, this is the temple in Hong Kong, Susan uh, Monetary. It's a very modern monastery with no worshiping, but basically it's a learning institution, Buddhist. Uh, in the introduction, there are two uh, phrases that inspired me. It said, yi nian dong, yi yuan sheng. When you have a new idea, you will, have, it will come to a new horizon. Ideas are important. And that is where innovation comes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Cheng. Um, to me, it's fascinating to hear the two talks. Uh, it seems that um, Professor Cheng has explained to us uh, why big picture learning is so influential. Because there's one new idea, brings about a new horizon. Um, let's, there's a very short panel discussion. Could I invite um, Elliot and Professor Cheng to come on stage again? Please take a seat. I would also allow a bit of time for questions because I know that today we have um, people from Hong Kong and also Shanghai and elsewhere. Um, perhaps let's, um, let's start with Elliot because you didn't really have time to talk about um, big picture learning <coughs> and how it is done. For example, uh, you told me yesterday that um, uh, you know the um, the teenagers uh, would you know seek internships in their community and they would give people a call and say hi I'm interested in this uh, could I come to shadow you for a day um, and and that's how it starts I, I wonder whether you can talk a little bit more of that um, surely uh, in the Hong Kong culture context this seems a bit difficult, uh, imagine you call up uh, a CEO of a listed company and say, I want to come and shadow you. Um, they might fail. So, so how do we build these relationships? And, and you know, how could the advisors help and the school help? Because that is actually the essence of big picture learning, is to connect the community to the schools. Elliot, please. Uh, right, well, uh, thanks. Actually, our schools start with uh, from three-year-olds all the way through college, we have our own college. Um, having said that, 
uh, at the high school level, we allow students um, to follow their interests and make choices, interests with an S, choices with an S, and go on their journey. Uh, they know people already. Their parents know people. There's retired people. There's all sorts of people out there who have avocations as well as vocations around using the entire community, including industry, including small businesses, not just the large corporate, but the small where there's intimate relationships around people knowing your know-how, your know-what, and knowing you. Our students get hired because they're known for their values as well as what they can do. And they know those people. You use the parents. If you went to our schools in India, you would see 13-year-olds uh, uh, working on spreadsheets around investment funds. Yeah, it's not unusual for people in cultures all over the world, including the United States, to follow in their families, businesses, and some kind of offshoots. And those were those relationships that I showed everybody up there. You are always whether you realize it or not as a parent or as somebody who's playing in an, or doing work in an outside organization with a student, which we didn't talk about as well. Students are doing stuff all the time outside of school. Um, their parents involve them because the students want to get involved or the, sometimes the parents are playing a negative role and say, you're going to learn this no matter what. And those kinds of experiences no, change you. So having said that, that opens up that whole world and dimensions to how you can pursue and follow your interests. And what we do is we get students to actually make the calls. They're the ones who call up because an adult, and this is that, those neurotransmitters floating around, but it's also relationships and content. I want to learn from you. By the time you're three years old, you're already identifying objects that you want to learn about and people you want to teach you about. The, not grandma, grandpa. He's going to teach me how to tie my shoes. This is very, very old. And when people get a call, hi, I'm Elliot. Um, I want to learn about shoeing horses. And I heard that you do that and you do it well. I really want to learn. Can I come over and spend a day with you? Not an internship, just a day. Sure, if you're interested in what I'm interested in, fine. Doesn't matter, diesel engines, oil painting, architecture, microbiology. What happens is that relationship starts clicking in. Oh, you're interested in what I'm interested in? That's pretty cool. Um, can I come here? My school allows me to come here two days a week. Can I come here and spend a quarter with you? Uh, yeah, and by the way, my advisor, who's my teacher, is going to come out here, and we're going to develop projects around what I'm doing out here. You don't have to worry about that. We'll take care of that. And then we'll follow that up three days while we're inside of school, because our schools pay attention to how you learn your learning style. One-on-one, -on -one, small group, classrooms, learning by doing, all those pieces, college classes. So our students are out as well doing that. That's how it starts. Now, it sounds crazy, and most people say, oh, you'll never get 50 students. That's what they said to us in province. We've had thousands, tens of thousands of internships in cities. People want to do this, and they feel the obligation and, and the sense of responsibility around it. And by the way, it's happening, whether you know it or not. There are, I've spoken to people all over Hong Kong, and they're all getting jobs but not by just what they know, but who they know or somebody who knows who they know. <laughs> it's happening. We can't stop doing that. That's why you're all here about this network. You're actually mesh working, we call it, not networking, because network is very linear. And I'll stop there. But I, it's a, 
Sorry to take yes, I, I think Professor Chen wants yeah. to respond. Yeah. And, oh. and oh, yes, I, yes. I also want to point out that your second principle in science of learning about experience, about early experience in society, actually echoes what um, Elliot has been oh, advocating. Yes, yes, yes. We are thinking the same because the, yeah. the, the, the world is the same. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I have, uh, your, to your question, I think fundamental there is the matter of trust. We talk about trusting students. You believe that they can achieve. Uh, principles to trust teachers. Now you, you, you think of society, you have to trust society has that intention, has that faith, and has that kind of a motive. Uh, I started when I was working in the university, the mentorship program, where the mentors got no incentive, no, no num uh, remuneration, and uh, they volunteer. And now the, the big education uh, platform, most of the organizations volunteer. And uh, so I think you have to trust that this is something that we have to let, give space to society rather than asking them to, begging them to do anything. Right, I want to ask one more question uh, and then over to you. Um, we, we all know that um, you know, Asia, the whole of Asia is exam oriented. Um, whether it's mainland China, Hong Kong, um, Korea and Japan, and I know um, a lot of people approach Elliot to say, well, can Big Picture uh, goes to China, okay, Big Picture comes to Hong Kong, etc." And, you know, they are actually thinking about, like, the after-school activities, extracurricular activities, while not really lessening the curriculum and giving space within the curriculum and outside curriculum. Now, I'm, I guess, Elliot, you are not really in favor of that, uh, but perhaps you can tell us more. Uh, what a big picture can, can be just an extracurricular thing? Um, so, it, it's a good question. Uh, exams, if they take up all the time of students, you're not getting anywhere. You're still in the same place. So how do you make something new? That's the innovation. Because we know more now. We look at the data that was presented here. We know that people are going to have, it's a gig economy, as people say. We always say interests and choices. Those are real important pieces. So there are cracks. You're only graduating, according to what I hear, 100% of your high school students, 18% are going to college. Right? Am I right about that? What about the other 82%? What the heck are they doing in school? taking the same curriculum that everybody's taking but not getting to the same place. That's an equity issue. That's an access issue. And that's my boldness. I would fight that. Um, that's wrong. Because it's not equitable. Equity doesn't mean sameness. It means you get what you want and need. It's very, very different. Yeah. Professor Chen, any yes, thoughts? I, I, I think, first of all, what is happening is uh, perhaps already gone beyond what you assumed, that uh, schools are only interested in uh, extracurricular activity in schools, which is not the, the, the case, as I mentioned. And increasingly, even in mainland China, the, the, the notion of a curriculum has changed. For example, uh, what they call uh, study, study tours, uh, which, is, which is quite widespread, is, is actually required in the curriculum for each child to have uh, opportunity to travel to other places. Uh, the issue is examination. Examination is predominating, and I don't, it will go out, I don't think it will go away in a few years' time because it's part of the society culture. If that is the case, I would argue that we have to be innovative, that examination is taken for granted, and you have to create space for things beyond examination. It's difficult to take it as an as a either-or thing, or it's a zero-sum game, right? You have, you, you have a tradition of examination, yeah, then do well in the examination, but that is only part of life. There are a lot of other things that we cannot deprive our students of. Yes, unfortunately, you know, we spend like 95% of our time uh, focusing on the word exam. Which is not true, which, which is, is not true, no longer true. No longer true. Okay, so I think there are lots of principles here. But I think parents would like to spend more time with the kids uh, in revising 
um, textbooks and so on. Um, anyway, over to you all for questions. Um, we have a question to my right. Please introduce yourself and share your question. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer. Thank you both so much for a really inspiring discussion. Um, I kind of have a multifaceted question. And it has to do with the point that you both made about how learning happens outside of the classroom. And there's a lot of untapped resources and non-traditional educators, maybe people like parents or you know, religious institutions, people who might not see themselves as traditional educators and therefore not understand the potential impact that they could have on the students. Um, we've, we've had quite a student motivation oriented analysis of what motivates students to engage or disengage, but have you given any thought to how you can engage the non-traditional educators, maybe parents who feel like they're not qualified to teach their students over a tutor, or peer mentors, or, you know, the list goes on. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, Professor Chang first? Uh, I'll try first. Again, the matter of uh, trust, and uh, because you have to believe that there are potentials in parents, and if you give them space, give them the activity and the, the opportunity to do that. You see many parents in Hong Kong schools are helping their children, not only within the curriculum, but also outside in their own company, their, their friends, and so on and so forth. I think we have to paint a realistic picture about what is happening, and that's the starting point of where we can move forward. If you assume that everything is so deadlocked, then we can do nothing. If you think that students are stupid, they are stupid. Right? This is the fundamental trust. Whether you think society has the potential and it has the incentive to do that, not monetary incentive, then we give them opportunity, like students. If you think that they are all kind of uh, bookworms, they are all preparing for examination, do, have we given them any opportunity to do anything else? Right? I think this is this is about your 95% thing. Yeah. And uh, I think things are changing very quickly. You go to any school in Hong Kong, they will give you some good things. Nonetheless, examination pressure is still there. And I don't think in my lifetime, I'm, I'm older, maybe in your lifetime, you may not be uh, seeing uh, examination totally eliminated. It's a different culture. It's shaped not by education, Asian. It's shaped by society and long-term culture. So trust. Trust. Elliot. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll ask you, where'd you learn to read? So, no, no, but I, 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 it's just rhetorical in a sense. Where did you learn? Did you learn to read in school? Did you learn to read on your grandmother's lap? These are, we're all teachers. It's about the relationship and the content together, about who we choose to learn from and how we can learn. What's going on in school is only a part of it. Schools get the blame, they get the credit, but it's not happening there most of the time. I can tell you that. But just like creativity, it's not happening sitting in a seat and just daydreaming out the window. They're active outside, doing other activities, and something happens. And many of the people that I know are trying to figure that out. And none of us have really figured it out. Where's that creative spark come from? When does it happen? All that kind of stuff. So I would encourage parents and outside organizations, they are the teachers. As a matter of fact, a teacher in front of 40 students lecturing, are you kidding me? How many students are really learning that stuff at that moment? Please. So, no, and, and I mean that in all sincerity. Really think about where you're learning and how. Yes, I think uh, back to examination. It doesn't mean that examination cannot be changed and should be changed. Uh, the test of examination, I think, is very simple. If you allow everybody to go into the, the, the examination hall uh, with an iPad, with connection to Wi-Fi, then you really don't know what to test them. <laughs> right? That, that, that can be done easily. Well, Say one more thing. Sure, Elliot, yeah. no, say no, one I, more thing, you say two I think, more things. And I'm going to put the onus on uh, the university level. If the university accepts students by the things that they can do and the recommendations that they get from people in the out, you watch. If you, tell, if you say you've got to dunk a basketball to get into the Harvard, you're going to see a lot of five, six kids dunk basketballs. All right? It's that kind of simple. So the university has a responsibility here. 
around making change. Now, my, my <laughs> advisor professor from the university says it's easier to move a cemetery than a college. That's what he told me. So they move slow. <laughs> but when they move, and they have in the United States, 700 universities in the United States and colleges don't look at ACT, SAT scores anymore. Yeah, thank you. So it's changing. Yes. Right. Um, Frankie over there has a question. Uh, Frankie Poon is uh, a headmaster principal. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's very inspiring. Because uh, my question, well, actually, uh, I really agree that everyone is a teacher. And you know, as a practitioner, sometimes we work in school and we don't feel like being a teacher in some of the activities that are happening in school. Uh, my question actually based on three concepts that today uh, that you, know, you two speakers mentioned. One is the big picture, the second one is muddling through, and the third one is innovation. Now, um, we're not short of big picture. And then well, my, my question is, how, can, or how does the big picture help us to muddle through? Because when we're muddling through, we don't seem to see the big picture. And the second question, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the second thing is that, you know, we have a lot of innovative practices happening around. And then, uh, uh, but we, somehow we don't, you know, when we are muddling through, we see all this innovation, we see all these big picture. But, you know, in the afternoon, when I go back to my school, I have to continue to muddle through all the chores. Um, how, well, what can we do to connect all these good ideas? Right, so I, I'll say, that's the next talk. And I will talk, but it's a, it's a long conversation. But the short version of it is you have to have vision and you have to have focus on your vision and not to lose that. And you keep muddling through. You never get to your vision. That's why it's a vision. But you keep focusing and you be active and in your practice and you learn and be active and reflect as you're doing and reflect after you're doing it. It's a quick answer. Right. Professor Chen. Yeah, I think we, we have to move away from a paradigm which is a plantation model, right? You do, you do all by design that everything will come out as you expected, right? You have to think of what is controllable, what is not controllable, what has to be controlled, what need not be controlled. If you think of, then the muddling through is much more comfortable, right? And that is perhaps also what uh, Charles Lindbrom's idea. Muddling through is the, is the daily uh, routine. We have time for one more question as well, but three hands. Um, the gentleman to my right. Uh, Professor Cheng, uh, this year uh, Hong Kong is talking about STEM education. Can you tell us uh, about uh, your opinion on, on this uh, regarding how to equip our uh, uh, youngsters to prepare for the for, for future? Professor Chen, before you answer, because uh, I want to give opportunity to one more, Helen, uh, because she's from the Good Lab, uh, and she, um, she does parent education. So over to Helen, uh, you have the last question. Thank you, Ada. Um, I just want to um, ask my question to the speakers, because uh, we talk a lot about trust, trusting the parents, trusting the educators, trusting the kids to learn by themselves. Uh, but can you share a real case in your project uh, that how much balancing are you giving the trust to the kids that they can learn by themselves and how much we're meddling in their education? Because this is a constant struggle that um, I do with my company, Oh My Kids. Uh, we want to give them an opportunity to voice out and even act, but how much as an adult should we meddle with their business yeah, thank uh, you. Right, uh, STEM education and muddling through. Oh, I can take the latter, but uh, did you, uh, it was addressed to. Um, please, oh, so you, you, you take the uh, head okay. question. Right, so family engagement is a big deal for us. Four to, uh, and we listen to parents once again. We're with students, not always doing something to students. So you have to have a culture of trust in the school, it doesn't work if it's not like that, and we, you have to build that culture. It comes from the students. Our students have very serious voices that are heard. In most schools, there's a, they don't have the kind of agency because they can't move. But if you're moving inside and out and learning inside and out, all of a sudden things change. If you're really listening to parents, if parents are really seeing what their children are learning, 
and you're exposing that. If there's a real learning plan meeting for each and every student, and the parents involved, the mentors, the advisor, and the student is there, and I'm talking about five-year-olds being at the learning plan meeting and saying, I want to learn how to cook spaghetti. I mean, I don't care really what it is. It's that their voice is heard, and they're making choices, and they see their, they feel like they have power. So that's a quick answer to it. Right. STEM education. Uh, but I also want to respond to them. Please, yes, <laughs> STEM please, education, I, I like the question, but I don't have an answer. <laughs> because you, you have the question, yes, I have the questions as well. STEM, everybody says STEM, therefore I have to do STEM. That is a very bad uh, kind of culture, right? And actually STEM is interpreted by different people differently. So congratulations, since you have the question, you have the freedom to do whatever you want <laughs> about STEM. And this is what is happening in Hong Kong schools. Right? You go to primary schools, 10 primary schools have different ways of interpreting STEM. Quote, good, this is diversity. On this case, I can give you one real example. In a real school in Hong Kong, a, a, a general subsidized school with no additional resources, 10 students, students divide into 10 in uh, groups of 10. They are given the task to discuss them among themselves and to perform next week three pigs, the story of three little pigs. Three little pigs, one pig mother, and one wolf. And the teacher does nothing to tell them what to do. So they started to, ex to explain. They know the story. And the first thing is they began to understand that we are 10 here, only five rows. <laughs> so it isn't quite uh, good. So they try to rewrite the play and add the two dogs. <laughs> right? And then they try to do a lot of uh, resource allocation to see who is going to do what. And after that, it's a long process. They, you know, children are not like, a, like a management board meetings. And then they try to ask the roles to, to try, right? Try to uh, sound like a wolf, <laughs> like a pig. And then one of the dogs could not park, uh, could not bark. <laughs> So they said, you can't bark, <laughs> try hard. <laughs> Still, he couldn't bark. <laughs> okay, you are removed. They change it to somebody else. <laughs> this I heard from a parent of that school. And that school I happen to know very well. And I said, this is a wonderful process. Yeah. Right? It's decision making, resource allocation, crisis management, <laughs> everything you want in management school is happening there. <laughs> if the child, in a year, has five or six such experiences. Right. Marvelous. Right. And but what happened to the dog who couldn't bark? <laughs> so he, mu he must have felt really, really disappointed. No, no, that, that is a reality. So the students have to handle. So he had to pick himself up again. No, no, the, the students have to handle. Right. If the child is crying because I can't play the part, no, no, you have to handle. So you have to leave them and they can do these things. Now, I have to give you an extreme example, not here in, in, in Japan. Uh, I'm not so sure how many of you have watched the, the, uh, the, uh, the video, uh, preschool in three cultures. The first culture is Japan, the second is China, the third is uh, US. You can't believe it, it's in Japan. You thought this Japan is a very disciplined society? No, the kids are fighting. Uh, punching each other. Punching each other. And uh, the girl goes to the, to the teacher and says, they are fighting. The teacher <laughs> says, you should be able to handle ourselves. In the US, it will be a legal problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> Depends what school. Depends yeah. what school. So I, I really think that there, there are a lot of space for us to move our hands away from the students. Yes, absolutely. I think that is really a great example and a real story to end this session on education innovation. Um, the vision is out there and the opportunities are limitless. So um, thank you very much. Could, could we join together and uh, give our two inspiring speakers the biggest round of applause, Dr. Elliot Washaw and Professor Chen Kai Ming. Now, I know that you all want to network with the speakers, but they must leave in five minutes because we're working there really hard. They have to attend a luncheon talk now. All right, so if you want to get to know them more, please come up. Yes, absolutely. And, and we'll have to leave soon. Thank you very much for participating in this session. Oh, and we have an Ed Novation Fest.
tomorrow and on Sunday at the HKICC School of Creativity. The pamphlets, I think you've got the pamphlets on the way in. If you have not, please ask uh, my colleagues on your way out. Yes. And uh, Dr. Washoe will also be a keynote speaker at, at Novation Fest. So I hope to see you there this weekend.